So what we're going to talk about today is transport processes. Um, how do we get things into and out of cells, or how do we get things across membranes? So when we talk about transport processes, we're primarily thinking about getting solutes from one side of a membrane to the other. Could be plasma membrane, could be chloroplast, whatever. Okay? So let's take a very simple example. Here's a plasma membrane. So here's inside the cell. Here's outside the cell. And let's assume this is a typical plant cell. So the membrane potential is going to be something on the order of minus 120 millivolts. So what do we mean by minus 120 millivolts? What's the distribution of charge if the membrane potential is 120 millivolts? Uh, okay, if there's negative charge inside the cell, then there's something else important going on. If there's an excess of negative charge inside the cell, what else must be true? Excess of positive charge in the cell? Yeah, right. So the charge has to be balanced. So it's more negative inside and more positive outside. Remember, membrane potential is defined as the charge inside relative to outside with the outside arbitrarily set to zero. Okay, so if whenever the membrane potential is negative, it means it's more negative inside, more positive outside. And the good thing is that's true for all cells. Bacteria, yeast, uh, plants, animals, all cells. More positive outside, more negative inside. All cells have a negative membrane potential. Not surprising because membrane potential is probably very important as we'll see in transport processes in all cells, going back to the earliest cells. The progenitor of all cells must have had uh, something to set up a negative membrane potential. Okay, so let's talk about uh, potassium ion, and let's just say that potassium inside is 10x, and the potassium outside is 1x. So we have a 10 times potassium gradient. So if we assume that the membrane is permeable to potassium, and we're not going to worry about at this point how that permeability is established, we should know that if this is just a pure lipid membrane, the potassium ion is not going to cross that membrane. So if potassium gets across, there's got to be some sort of transport protein. But let's not worry about it yet. Let's just assume that it can get across. Which way will potassium move in this situation? I mean? Towards the, from the inside towards the outside? Okay, why do you say that? Okay, so let's break this down for a second. Which way is the concentration gradient pointing? Outside. When you say outside, you mean towards the outside? Which way is the electrical gradient point for potassium? From outside to inside. <laughs> Which one wins? It's got to be the sum of the two of them. So which one's larger? How do you figure out which one's larger? Calculated, yeah, right? Plug and chug in an equation. What equation would we use? The Nernst equation, right? So the Nernst equation takes into account the differences in the concentration gradient across the membrane plus the differences in the membrane potential, the electrical component. So don't, you don't have to write down the Nernst equation. It's in your textbook. You don't have to memorize it. But do remember that the free energy has two components. So in this case, we're going to talk about the ion, the free energy associated with, with the ion moving from the outside towards the inside. Right? So outside becomes the initial state. Inside becomes the final state. Delta G is final minus initial. So this is going to be RT log concentration of potassium 
out divided by the concentration of potassium in. Oh, that's backwards. Sorry. Plus ZF delta E. Okay, so as Simi pointed out, one way to answer this question is plug the numbers in and chug, right? I don't want you to do this. You can, but it, doing, in doing that, you negate your understanding of what's going on. Remember back in lecture two, I suggested that one thing that we think about is the non-trivial case when the delta G is equal to zero, but there is a chemical gradient and there is an electrical gradient. So if delta G is equal to zero, these two must balance each other, equal and opposite. So remember what I said, if we pick, make a factor of 10 concentration gradient, what's the membrane potential that's just required to balance that? Remember what that was? Nobody remembers? 60 millivolts. So a factor of 10, if the concentration gradient is a factor of 10 for a monovalent ion with a charge of 1, the membrane potential that just balances that is minus 60 millivolts. Okay? So here we have a factor of 10 concentration gradient pointing outwards. And we have a factor of, we have 120 millivolts electrical potential pointing inward. Which one wins? Electrical gradient, right? Right? The electrical gradient, if it's 120 millivolts, that's equivalent to a factor of 100 concentration difference, not a factor of 10. Right? So the concentration gradient is pointing out, but the electrical gradient is pointing in, and the electrical gradient wins. In fact, we could say that. It takes 60 millivolts of membrane potential to balance the concentration gradient. The actual membrane potential is 120 millivolts. So the additional energy that's available in the electrical gradient to move potassium in would be about 60 millivolts. Right. So if you want to plug and chug, I can't keep you from doing that. But what I would like you to do is really think about, always draw a picture. Whenever I ask you a question about transport processes associated with charged species. Draw a picture that makes sure you understand which way the electrical gradient is pointing, which way the concentration gradient is pointing, and, and figure out independently for those two which one is more important by whatever mechanism you want. But I prefer you think about it from this balance picture, that a factor of 10 gradient is equivalent to about 60 millivolts, minus 60 millivolts. All right, so that tells us then for this particular situation, the delta G for potassium to move from the, um, let's see, if we want to move it from the outs inside to the outside, K in, K out, is about minus 60, equivalent to minus 60 millivolts, the energy associated with that. Okay, so will potassium move out under these conditions? Is there a driving force for potassium to move out? No, to move in, right? Sorry, I got this backwards. We want to go. No, that's, yeah, we want to move out to in, sorry. Is there a driving force for potassium to move into the cell in this condition? Will potassium move into the cell? If there is something that allows it to move across the membrane. So we need to think about this in the same context that we think about enzymes. Enzymes lower the activation energy for a reaction for A plus B going to C. Transport proteins lower the activation energy to get something across a barrier. There's an activation energy to getting a charged solute from one side of the membrane to the other. That activation energy is associated with putting that charged solute in the middle of the hydrophobic lipid bilayer. So what, in a general sense, is a transport protein doing 
to lower the activation energy barrier to move something across the membrane. What is a transport protein doing to allow a solute to move from one side of the membrane to the other? Think about it. Anna? Provides a path, but let's be a little bit more specific about the characteristics of that path. I'm not interested in the structure of it. Stella? It's decreasing the resistance, but how? Why? Why is, why is the protein channel or carrier decreasing the resistance? What's changing? Yang? It's more hydrophilic, right? So the, the, the middle of the membrane is very hydrophobic. Hydrophobic does not like charges, right? So if you provide a hydrophilic channel or a hydrophilic region for the solute to move through, that lowers the activation energy barrier. So in the simplest sense, you should be thinking about transport proteins as being like enzymes. They're lowering the activation energy barrier. The other thing that makes that very useful is we talked about the fact that we can regulate enzymes by changing their conformation, right? Changing the conformation, you can raise or lower the activation energy barrier. You can do the same thing for transport proteins. You can turn on and turn off transport proteins by changing their conformation. And we'll talk, give some examples of that in just a little bit. Okay, so we need to think about how these proteins affect membrane permeability and the ability to move things across the membrane. All right, so let's take another example, one from your textbook. This is related to the problem, what's referred to as diffusion potential. So the situation we're going to set up here is we're going to put potassium and chloride on both sides of a membrane that's permeable to both potassium and chloride. But we're going to start off with a higher concentration of potassium chloride in compartment A compared to compartment B. All right? Initial scenario, okay? So the key thing to understanding this problem is to recognize that the diffusion coefficient for potassium is greater than the diffusion coefficient for chloride, due for some to the characteristics of the, the transport proteins that are present in this membrane. Okay? Let's not worry about why at this point. Let's just assume that this is the case and ask what the consequences are. Okay? So if we start off with higher potassium chloride on this side than this side, and the membrane is permeable to both potassium and chloride, but more permeable potassium, what is going to happen? What's going to happen in, if we, this is our starting situation? What happens as time goes on? Okay, so a key, two key things that you said there. Ultimately, we're going to reach a situation where the potassium and chloride concentrations are equal on both sides, right? It's going to go towards equilibrium. No surprise there, right? This is going to go towards equilibrium if we let it go long enough. But because the, the ability of the membrane to transport potassium is greater than chloride, we're going to go through some situation where potassium is moving through the membrane faster than chloride. What will the consequences of that differential transport of potassium and chloride be as far as membrane potential is concerned. Yeah, okay, so you're, you're going too fast for, for me. Oh. I can't keep up with it. <laughs> the first thing is, is potassium moving across more quickly then there's going to be a, a net positive charge on this side and a net negative charge on this side. Positive on this side because there's an excess of potassium, negative on this side because there's an excess of chloride, right? Okay, so this membrane potential that is due to differential diffusion of charged things is referred to as a diffusion potential. It's due to this right here, differential permeability of the membrane 
to charged species. Okay, so as Hemi was getting at, the, but I couldn't keep up with him, once we generate this membrane potential, what is the consequence of that membrane potential for subsequent transfer of ions? How does this membrane potential affect the movement of potassium ions? Does it increase it or decrease it? It decreases it, right? Because if there's a positive charge on this side, now the electrical gradient is not favorable for potassium to move. How about for chloride? It increases it, right? Because it is favorable for chloride to move. So as soon as this diffusion potential is generated, it creates an electrical environment that tries to slow down the thing that's moving faster and speed up the thing that's moving slower. But eventually, you let this go long enough, it's going to come to an equilibrium. Do diffusion potentials exist in cells? Do diffusion potentials exist in living cells? Unfortunately, the textbook tells you yes. But the real answer is no. Let's leave that, keep that in your memory for a second. We'll come back to this in a few minutes okay? to understand what's the difference between what we're seeing here and what we see in a living cell. Pardon me? Uh, yeah, if you think t everything you read in the textbook is correct, um, you're mistaken. Most things in textbook are correct. And this, how you define what a diffusion potential is, chemists don't really even completely agree upon it. There's sort of like two schools of thought. But what's the difference? We'll, we'll talk about it for just a minute here. What's the difference? between what exists right here and what exists in a living what happens in a living cell there's a real important difference what is it anna okay so the membrane is but the membrane is differentially permeable right yes it is absolutely But are those channels, do those channels all let every, every difference ion that's present in the cytoplasm? Is the permeability of the plasma membrane identical for each one of those ions? No. no. So could we have a situation where we set up a diffusion potential in cells? We could. But there's really important difference. And it's so simple, you're missing it. Steve? Is it the protein in the membrane? Well, the protein. But these ions aren't moving through a lipid bilayer. They won't. There has to be some sort of proteins or something in here to let those ions go across. So in that sense, these are the same. Okay. That's just right. Well, don't we start off with the membrane potential in the first place, and that the membrane potential we get through the diffusion is minor compared to what we have to start off with? Yeah, there's some differences there. Let's go one step further. You're, you're getting closer, but you're still missing the main point. What's the end point of this scenario? Equilibrium. Equilibrium. Does that happen in cells? No, no never. What's the difference then? What's the difference? Yang? Yeah. Say that again. Cells usually have a more negative charge on the inside. Why? Because um, it's a selectively permeable membrane. No. No, oh, you're missing something important. Okay. Don't have that energy input. Yeah, there's no energy input in here, right? We haven't talked about active transport yet, but this we put some energy in somehow by putting more potassium and chloride on this side than on this side. Right? In cells, we don't do that. Cells generate gradients by active transport. Right? Any active transport here? Right? This, so this is, this is an important distinction. Diffusion potential, if you generate a diffusion potential and you let it go over time, it will always go to equilibrium. A cell will never go to equilibrium unless it's dead. Right? A cell at equilibrium is dead because the cell is always investing energy to keep things away from equilibrium so it can drive transport processes. We'll, we'll see some examples of this in, in just a second. So one thing I want to, want to spend just a second talking about that students get confused about 
in this situation right here, where there's more potassium on this side and more an excess of chloride on this side, where are those excess potassium and chloride ions located? Close to the membrane. Why do you say that? Uh, that's what the yes, so, okay, so you're demonstrating very well that you remember what was in the book, but you're not demonstrating that you're using the, your brain to understand it. I'm not picking on you. Is the charges a track? Yeah, because charges a track, right? So if you have excess positive on this side and excess negative on this side, are they going to be floating around up here or are they going to be close to each other? They're going to be close to each other, right? So this is the principle of electrical neutrality. If you look out in the bulk solution on either side of the membrane, you won't see any extra positive or negative charges. In the bulk solution, electrical neutrality is maintained. It's because the extra positive and negative charges, since they're mobile, they can move around, there's an attractive force that's pulling them in this way. So they're all going to be localized along the membrane. So when we think about what, where those ions are located, under most circumstances, we should be thinking about them, the excess charges being localized right along the surface of the membrane. That makes sense? We'll see that this becomes important in some situations. OK, now, a question that came up numerous times in the comments that you sent in last night, and that is the difference between steady state versus equilibrium. This is confusing until you get it straight in your brain. So we'll go through it, and if it's still confusing, you need to talk to somebody about it, because this is important. You really need to understand this. The similarity between steady state and equilibrium is that there is no net flux. So if we're talking about transport processes, in a steady state solution, there's no net flux of things across the membrane. In equilibrium, this one we're already familiar with, there's no net flux across the membrane. But the distinction between them, we know at equilibrium, there's no free energy difference. But in steady state, the delta G does not equal zero. How can this be? How can we have no net flux but the delta G for whatever is moving not being zero? So what is, how does active transport make that happen? Let's, here's a membrane. So describe a situation where we have no net flux but the delta G not being zero. This isn't a trivial question. Yeah. It isn't a trivial. Let me give you, let me give you uh, a hypothetical solution, OK? So let's take ion x. We don't care what ion x is. But ion x is being moved out of the cell using ATP, using the energy of ATP. So hydrolyzing ATP is moving x out of the cell. This is active transport. We'll talk more about this in just a second. So that means the concentration of X outside the cell, let's not worry about what its charge is, the concentration of X outside the cell is greater than inside. 
So is there a chemical or a gradient for X to move back into the cell? Yeah. Right, so if there's a transport protein, if there's something that could allow X to move through the membrane, it would move back down there. Now can you see the situation where here the cell is putting energy in to pump X out and there's a, some sort of a transport protein that's letting, letting them move back in. So the net flux is balanced, but in order to keep that flux going, if we just shut this off, what would happen to the distribution of X? It would, it would reach equilibrium, right? If there's a, if there's a low uh, resistance pathway for X to move across, it would move across until the concentration was equal on the two sides. So what's keeping the concentration from being equal? The active transport. The active transport is perturbing the system away from equilibrium, and the passive transport is allowing it to move back towards equilibrium. And those two balance each other in terms of flux. We have delta G is not equal to zero. There's energy for X to move back into the cell. But that gradient is being maintained by a constant input of energy. So the thing that you need to, that's really important to distinguish between equilibrium and steady state is that equilibrium, there's no energy change in the system. At steady state, in order to maintain the condition that it's not at equilibrium, that there is a net delta G for a solute to move, the cell has to invest energy to make that happen. Now, it would be pretty foolish for the cell to pump X out and then just let X move back in again, right? That'd be like spinning wheels, wasting energy. This doesn't happen very much, but we'll see that more complicated situations exist that set up the same sort of situation. Yes, Stephen. Yeah. So, yeah, so I sent you an email back. That was your comment. I sent you an email back that said that's, you found one of the places where the book is wrong. It's just an incorrect statement in the book. So that was figure 6.1, I think. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's the, the first one that had uh, the three different scenarios. And for the steady state scenario, it said, no, for the E, which I can't remember what it was. Yeah, yep. Yeah, so to maintain steady state, you need to continually put energy in. This describes life. Remember back in the second lecture topic where we talked about didn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't life disobey the second law of thermodynamics, right? It, what life is doing is constantly investing energy to keep the system away from equilibrium so things can move down gradients in the direction the cell wants to make them move. That's it. You've just, that's the energetics of life. Cells are investing energy to perturb the system away from equilibrium so that moving towards equilibrium facilitates processes the cell wants to have happen. And we'll give some examples of that right now. Okay, so is the distinction between equilibrium and steady state, we got that? All right, if you don't, please come talk with me about it. All right. So let's do a simple experiment. This is the experiment that's in table 6.1, I think, in the textbook. What we want to do for a different bunch of different ions, we're going to make a table here, and we're going to put, look at the concentration of the ion, uh, which way do they do it, outside the cell. And then we're going to use the Nernst equation to predict what the concentration in would be at equilibrium and then we'll also look at what the concentration on the inside actual 
So this is assuming a membrane potential, I think for the textbook example, is minus 110 millivolts. So plant membrane potentials are typically on the order of 100, minus 100 to minus 150 millivolts. For this particular one, it was they used minus 110. OK, so let's start off with potassium. In the experiment they did, they made the concentration of potassium outside one millimolar. And so we know the membrane potential. We know the charge on the ion. We know the inside concentration. We can calculate, I'm sorry, we know the outside concentration. We can calculate using the Nernst equation. If potassium was in equilibrium, what would the inside concentration be? And if you do that, it comes out to be about 74 millimolar. First of all, why? Why is the inside, why at equilibrium would the inside concentration be 70 times larger than the outside concentration? Uh, okay, so? All those are correct, but you haven't told me anything about how that affects the concentration difference of potassium. So is the cell more positive outside or more negative inside? Yes. How does that, why, how does that explain this? Well, the potassium on the outside of the cell will have, be driven um, more to the inside because it's more energetic. Good. Great. So there's an electrical gradient that would, we would expect to move potassium into the cell. Right? So at equilibrium, the electrical gradient moving potassium in would be balanced by the chemical gradient trying to move the potassium out. Okay? That makes sense? This is important. Okay, so the actual concentration of potassium inside the cell is about 75 millimolar. So what can we, can, what can we conclude about the concentration or the distribution of potassium across the plasma membrane of this plant cell? It's close to equilibrium. Yep. It's approximately equilibrium. And if you look at any cell, bacteria, fungi, yeast, plants, animals, potassium is almost always very close to equilibrium. <coughs> so again, that must be something that goes back in an evolutionary sense to the very first cells. Why that's the case, interesting question. Don't really know what the answer to that is. But it's observed in basically all cells. Okay? Certainly one of the things that must contribute to it is that the membrane must have a high permeability to potassium. Most plasma membranes are highly permeable potassium. That's what allows this equilibrium to be established. Okay, let's take another ion. Let's take magnesium. And the concentration that they used outside for some reason is 0.25 millimolar. And when you plug that into the Nernst equation, we predict an internal concentration of 1,340 millimolar. But when we look at the actual concentration inside the cell, we see it's 3 millimolar. What can we conclude about magnesium ions? What can we conclude about magnesium ions? How about you, Patrick? What do you think? From this distribution, what can we conclude about magnesium ions? Let's compare what we predict at equilibrium and what we actually see. Is there more or less? OK, so what, how, what must be happening in order to see less than at equilibrium? What must be happening? Say that again? OK, so one possibility. He's completely correct. One possibility is that the membrane has, very, has no permeability to potassium at all. 
or to magnesium at all. But that's not the case. So if, there's, if there is permeability, what could account for it? Selena? And which way is that active transport going? Yeah. Magnesium is being actively transported out of the cell. The cell is investing energy to keep the magnesium equilibrium, keep the cell away from magnesium equilibrium by mo moving, potassium, or moving magnesium out of the cell. If we look at calcium, we see the same thing. Let's make sure I get the numbers right. And we predict two. So again, there's much less calcium inside the cell than we'd predict. And the way that must be happening is there must be some active transport out. And again, this is true for all cells. All cells tra actively transport calcium out of the cytoplasm. Under normal circumstances, the cytoplasmic calcium levels are low. We'll see that increases in cytoplasmic calcium play important roles in all sorts of signal transduction pathways. Right? So the cell must be spending energy to pump calcium out. Yeah, yeah. So this is this. Thinking about why is important. And we'll see why for calcium. Not today, but, we'll, but when we talk about signaling, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about calcium. Don't know the answer for magnesium. Let's take another ion. Let's take um, phosphate. So if we have a concentration of one outside, we would predict for a low concentration inside now because it's got a negative charge. But what we find is much higher phosphate inside the cell than outside. And that in the low cell H2PO4, instead of like PO4 minus. Oh, it says H2PO4 single minus? Yeah, so it's we just stuck two protons on. It's the same same thing. Oh, it, oh, you're right. It will affect what the gradient is because it affects the charge. Yeah, so I should do it that way. H2PO4 minus, right? Because if the charge is minus 1 or minus 3, that will affect where that equilibrium is. But in either case, what is the cell doing? How do we account for the fact that there's more in the cell than we'd expect? Active transport in, right? Why is the cell actively transporting phosphate in? This is an easy one. Even if we haven't covered it, you should know the answer. Yeah, for to all sorts of things. Phosphate is used in, for example, you, you need phosphate to make phospholipids. You need phosphate to make nucleotides for DNA and RNA and ATP. Right? So it's not surprising that the cells would actively transport phosphate in. Okay. Yes. No. No. Because will those contribute to that equilibrium? No. No. But I'm just wondering if that would also count in what you. I don't know how you're measuring. So if you're measuring the concentration of phosphate inside the cell, would the phosphate groups that are attached to ATP <coughs> or that are in DNA or RNA or that are in phospholipids, would they contribute to this concentration? No. It's only the free phosphates, right? So they wouldn't be like extracted with whatever extraction you <coughs> If you wanted to measure, remember, what, if we're, what we're trying to do here is to look at the free energy that's associated with movement of phosphate. Oh, I was just wondering how that is measured. I've never tried to measure something like that, so I wasn't sure. How do you measure the phosphate in the cytoplasm of a cell? You, you rupture the cell, and you do that under conditions where ATP and nucleotides and phospholipids are not degraded so that phosphate, phosphate concentration changes. Okay. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. But remember, if a phosphate gets stuck onto some other molecule, it's no longer a phosphate anymore. If it's stuck onto a glucose, we call that glucose phosphate. But that's not a free phosphate. The glucose phosphate won't diffuse down a concentration gradient the same way phosphate will because it's a different molecule. Okay? Okay, so in the context of steady state then, what we have here is a situation where if we look at these concentrations, do these concentrations in general change with time? No, they're constant. So what does that mean about if we look at phosphate? Is there a gradient for phosphate to move from inside to outside the cell? Does phosphate move from inside to outside the cell? If there is a channel or a carrier protein that can let it go, absolutely. So to keep that in balance, the cell must be investing energy to bring phosphate in. Right? For calcium, it's just the opposite. There's a gradient for, for calcium to move in, and the cell is investing energy to keep it out. Right? So this steady state condition exists not just for a single ion, but for virtually, under normal conditions, virtually all ions are in steady state across the membrane. Some process is pushing it away from equilibrium, and another process is allowing it to move towards equilibrium, and those two balance each other. Okay, so we need to spend some time now thinking about, we've sort of got a reasonable idea about the energetics, the driving forces. We need to think about the proteins themselves. What are the proteins that are facilitating potassium and chloride or calcium and phosphate to move across membranes? What are their general characteristics? Okay. So another question that students had uh, problems with. The two types of proteins, <coughs> not active transport proteins, but passive transport proteins that the... Um, the textbook talked about were channels and carrier proteins. And distinguishing channels and carrier proteins on the surface seems very easy. A channel is basically a pore through the membrane. It's like a permanent opening. There may be a gate at one end or the other that opens and closes it. But it's a pore that allows the, the solute to move across the membrane. So in the context of what we were talking about earlier, the protein provides a hydrophilic channel through the membrane that has a much lower resistance to the ion moving through than moving through the lipid bilayer. So the channel is relatively straightforward. Carrier protein confuses students. And what I want you to do is think of a carrier protein as being like an enzyme. The carrier protein has two different conformations, a conformation that opens a binding site on the outside of the cell and a conformation that opens the binding site on the inside of the cell. And that when the substrate binds, whatever's being carrier, carried binds, it causes the conformation to switch to the opposite state. Okay? So basically they're doing the same thing. Both are providing low resistance pathways, hydrophilic pathways for the solute to move across there. What's the biggest difference between a channel and a carrier protein? What's the biggest difference between a channel and a carrier protein? Anna? Is there a, lag time? a lag time in what sense? Well, Yeah, so you're, the lag time is a consequence of the thing that I'm really looking for. No, conformational changes, right? Big conformational changes here. Any conformational changes here? Do conformational changes take time? Yeah, if you've got to do big protein folding things to go from exposing a binding site on one side to exposing the binding site on the other side, this is going to be relatively slow. So a consequence of that difference 
is the permeability of channels is very high, on the order of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8th molecules per second. For a carrier protein, it's typically on the order of 100 to 1,000 solutes per second. So this is much higher permeability. Yeah, where does the energy come from? If it's a carrier protein. Right, free energy with associated with the electrochemical gradient of whatever is going across the membrane. Does is there an activation energy barrier that needs to be overcome? Of course, there always is. Right, but that activation energy must come from thermal energy in, in the environment. Right, so again, don't treat this any different than an enzyme. It is an enzyme, it just isn't doing making and breaking bonds. It's moving things from one side of the membrane to the other. Okay, so. Relatively slower, relatively more quickly. How about specificity? Would you expect channel proteins to be specific in what they transport? Yeah, just like an enzyme. How about, sorry, carrier proteins. How about channel proteins? Are they specific? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. There are some, ch some channels can be a little bit promiscuous in what they allow through. So channels that let potassium go through, can let a little bit of sodium go through, but not much. Yeah. We got time? Yeah, we got time. No, don't, in the first approximation, don't think of it that way. They're both specific. They're both specific. But Anna's question, how do you make, it's easy to see how you make this Specific, right? But the question is, how do you make a channel specific? In particular, suppose you have a channel There's a channel embedded in the plasma membrane. Okay, so let's say the channel is specific for ion Oops, let's make this a little bit more realistic. Here's ion X. Here's ion Y. Which should go through faster, X or Y? Uh -uh. Y won't go through at all. Why not? You know the answer to this. Exactly. Right. So remember, if this is an ion, when it's out in solution, is it just com floating around completely independently? It's not. What, is it, what, what would be the characteristic of either one of these ions? Yeah, they've got, they got some polar interactions with water molecules, right? So there'd be, if this had a positive charge, then there'd be the negative end of water molecules pointing towards it. These water molecules we would consider not to be free water molecules, right? They're the ones that are interacting with the ions to change the water concentration when we talk about solute potential. Right? So in order for X to go in here, the interactions that are happening with the water molecule need to be replaced by the interactions with the protein. Right? So we can imagine that when X is in here, if X is the right size, then it's close enough that those interactions can be occurring. But if Y tries to go in there, Y also has the same interactions with water molecules. But now, if when Y goes in there, it cannot form those same interactions as X does with the protein, then Y is going to be a lot happier out here in water than it will be in the channel. So it's the specificity of those interactions. It's not a binding site like in a carrier protein, like an enzyme. But there are spill, still specific interactions that are required between the solute and the lining of the channel. They have the same charge, but they have different ionic radius, substantially different ionic radius. And that's all we're talking about here is the difference. So yes, charge can make a difference too. But let's just say these are both plus one charges. 
right? So would you expect an ion of the same size with a negative charge to be able to go through the channel? I see a yes and a no. Why yes? Are there any inter charge interactions between the ion and the? Yes, there are. Channels have very important charge interactions. So if this channel is, it has a, po a positive charge, lets positive charge ions go through it, a negatively charged ion won't have those interactions and won't be able to go through. So it's not just size, it's size and charge. Make sense? Okay. So sp specific for both of them. Grace. We don't have ions moving through the lipid bilayer. The lipid bilayer is a barrier to ions moving through. In order to get an ion through, you've got to have one of these guys. You've got to have a channel or a carrier protein. Because the ions themselves are very unstable. The activation energy to put a positive or negative charge inside this lipid bilayer is extremely high. So it just doesn't happen. So ions aren't really free molecules until. When ion is in solution, are the ion molecules independent of everything else in solution? No, they're not. They're very tightly interacting with water. We know that has to be the case because these are the waters whose concentration is contributing to the lower water potential, more negative water potential in the solution compared to pure water. We tie these guys up. They're no longer free waters. They essentially lower the concentration of free water in a solution that's got solutes in it. So th these are all linked together. Don't see them as being separate things. I'm trying to read your eyes and tell, tell me whether this is making sense or not. I see kind of a mixture of that. You say you like a larger molecule, like the larger ion will go through. Why it will go through? Like rather than oh, like rather than the smaller one. Well, the larger one goes through because presumably, the, if it, let's just say this is an X channel. Yeah. It's specific for X. So that means that X being in the channel has to be approximately the same stability or maybe even a little bit lower stability than X, sorry, higher stability than X being interacting with water. And so that means there has to be very specific interactions between X and the, and the channel, right? That you're not going to get with Y or some other thing that has a different charge on it. Right? That's where the specificity of the channels come from. Okay, so whether we're talking about carrier proteins or channels, what these molecules are doing is providing a lower resistance pathway for solutes to move across the membrane. They're not changing the free energy, just like an enzyme. Doesn't change the free energy, just changes the activation energy barrier. Okay, one last thing that distinguishes channels from carrier proteins. With one exception, one important exception, channel proteins carry ions, inorganic ions, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium. What's the exception? Aquaporins, right? Aquaporins carry water. But you don't get, there's no such thing as a glucose channel or a fructose channel. Those sorts of organic molecules, charged or not, move through carrier proteins. So 99.9% .9 of the time, other than water, channels carry inorganic ions only. Carrier proteins carry organic molecules, charged or uncharged. Okay, so we're left now to really consider
how active transport happens. This makes it relatively straightforward to see if there is a gradient how solutes can move across the membrane. But from what we talked about earlier, the last thing we need to consider is how do we generate the gradient? Because remember, under normal circumstances at steady state, that gradient is being maintained by inputting energy through active transport processes to generate a gradient that then these things dissipate. So the net is a steady state. So the question is, how do we generate these gradients. And the way these gradients are generated is by using what's called pumps. And all the pumps that we're going to be concerned with pump charge species. So these are ion pumps. One of the results of moving charges across the membrane is you create an electrical gradient. So these ion pumps are also referred to as being electrogenic. Creating an electrical gradient across the membrane. There are several different types of pumps. But one thing they have in common is these pumps all use ATP hydrolysis. is their source of energy. So they're hydrolyzing ATP and they're using the energy of ATP to move ions across the membrane against their gradients to create an electrochemical gradient. So there are, there are not many electrogenic pumps. If we look across all of life, there are just a few. The main ones are proton pumps, And these are present in prokaryotes. Fungi and plants. Animals have a different pump. They have a sodium potassium pump. And the other main type of pump uh, is a calcium pump. And that's in all organisms. But when we think about transport processes at the plasma membrane or at the vacuole membrane, it's the proton pump that's important in plants and the sodium potassium pump that's important in animals. Okay. So the main source of the cell injecting energy into the system to perturb equilibrium, the direct source of that energy is ATP-dependent ion pumping, in the case of plants, proton pumping, across the plasma membrane. Right? So it's taking the energy of ATP, and it's using that energy to move protons across the plasma membrane from the inside to the outside. So what's the result of this? What's the direct result of the plasma membrane proton pump in a plant cell? What's the direct result of this? Um, there, are, there are a lot of protons that are outside. Okay, so yeah, so there's a lot of protons outside. Let's go take that a little bit further. What's the consequence of that? Like the soil will become acidic. Okay, so does that just true for roots? No, it's true for... True for all cells. Yeah. So the outside of the cell is going to be more acidic than the inside of the cell. True for all plant cells, right? Because they all pump proteins. What else? I get a gradient between the outside and the inside. Of gradient of what? Electric from the... It gets more positive. Okay, and so... Because we have more outside than Good, inside. so we change the pH. We generate an electrical gradient, more positive outside than inside, and we generate a proton concentration gradient, more protons outside than inside. Is there energy in that proton gradient? Is there energy stored in that proton gradient? Yes. There's both concentration-dependent energy, moving down the concentration gradient, and there's electrical energy, 
moving down the electrical gradient. So this is an example of the first law of thermodynamics. Changing the form of the energy. Converting the energy from chemical bonds and ATP to electrical and concentration gradients across the membrane. Okay, we have one last step. Because where we've got now is we've generated an electrical gradient and a proton gradient across the membrane. But let's go back to our table. Remember we said that there was lots more phosphate inside the cell than outside. And lots more than we expected at equilibrium. And lots more magnesium inside the cell than outside. So we need to link the cells. Is there a ATP pump for phosphate? Is there an ATP pump for magnesium? No. So somehow we need to link the electrochemical gradient of protons that are created by this proton pump. We call this proton pump, all these electrogenic pumps, primary active transport. Primary active transport always uses the hydrolysis of ATP. So what we need to do is consider the next step of active transport. Using the energy of this proton gradient, or in animal cells, using the energy of the sodium and potassium gradients to drive all the other transport processes that go on at the plasma membrane. And this is the realm of secondary active transport. And your textbook uses as the example of this, one that we'll talk a lot about in a couple of lectures, a sucrose transporter. Sucrose is pumped into the cell against its electric, uh, well, there's no electrical gradient because sucrose isn't charged, against its chemical gradient. The concentration of sucrose is higher inside the cell than outside the cell. So energy needs to be put in in order to get sucrose in. And that energy comes from the electrochemical gradient of protons that was created by the primary ion pump. Protons moving in through this protein complex. Is there energy associated with this proton moving into the cell? Yes. Both gradients associated with the concentration and gradients associated with the electrical component. So somehow, the energy associated with this proton gradient is being coupled. Coupled, remember I said that's an important word? It's being coupled to moving sucrose in. And the nature of that coupling, I don't, I mean, it's very interesting how it works. I don't care that you understand any of the gory details other than the protein provides that coupling. The binding of the protons moving through the, through the protein must bring about some conformational change, provides the energy for conformational changes that allows the sucrose to move in. Just a sec. So let me ask you a question. This pump is on all the time, or most of the time in cells, because there's lots of transport going on. So there's always a proton gradient, electrical and chemical gradient for protons to move in. Suppose there's no sucrose outside the cell. Will protons still move in through this co-transport protein? Yeah, this one specifically, but it, the question is true for any co-transport protein. Would, sucro, would protons move in if there's no sucrose available? Why not? The, the correct answer is no. But let's justify why that's the case. So is this transporter like an enzyme that changes when you plug this in and that's how they get through? Yeah. Is that the reason? Yeah. Okay, so it's like if you have one key, but there are two, you will have the other one, then it's not. Yeah, yeah that's basically it. In order for this to complete its cycle, 
doesn't just have to bind protons, it's got to bind sucrose too. If there's no sucrose to bind, it can't do it. Let's think about it from purely an evolutionary perspective. What would be the consequence if this protein could allow protons to move in even if there's no sucrose there? Yeah, you waste energy. The energy that you just spent ATP on to get protons out would just go away, right? So this is an obligate co-transport. And the obligate nature of this is as a consequence of how the protein coupled these two processes together. Don't lose track of that. OK, so this particular type of co-transport is referred to as symport. Symport because the ion that's moving down its electrical chemical gradient is moving in the same direction as the thing that's moving against its electrochemical gradient. But we can have the opposite being true. So here again is symport. The proton is moving down its electrochemical gradient. Something else is moving in the same direction against its electrochemical gradient. But we can also have antiport. Proton moves in. Something else moves out against its electrochemical gradient. So this is a mechanism that we could get magnesium out of the cell couple magnesium transport out to proton transport in. So in a plant cell, here's the $64,000 question. In a plant cell, what is the ion that moves in in a co-transporter, that always moves in in a co-transporter? <laughs> you say that with such conviction. She said protons. Is that right? Why? Stephen, why is that right? Not, don't tell me it's because that's the only one it shows on the picture. Uh, well, it's because the, the proton and the electrochemical gradient is driving different processes, so you, you need the proton to slow down the gradient. Yeah, so the proton gradient is the only electrochemical gradient that's being produced by an active pump. Right? So if you've got to do co-transport, the energy from co-transport always must come from protons moving down their electrochemical gradient. They can move sucrose in or they can move magnesium out, but protons always have to move in because that's the source of energy for secondary electron transport. So in a very real sense, the primary pump is converting the energy of ATP into an electrochemical proton gradient. And then secondary active transport is converting that electrochemical proton gradient into gradients of other things that may be moving something in or moving something out. So in plants, one of the ions that's co-transported is always a proton because that's the source of energy for co-transport. It's the only source of energy that's available in plants. OK. One quick thing we want to think about. This was also a question that came up frequently in the comments that you made. So we could imagine that this is diffusion of water across the plasma membrane without going through an aquaporin. We could also imagine this could be the movement of a sodium ion through a sodium channel. But if we're talking about a glucose molecule moving through a glucose carrier protein, we don't see this linear behavior. We see something that is curved and that saturates. Why does simple diffusion follow a straight line and carrier transport have this curved saturation line? This is an important one. Stella? Good. So you you have defined why it saturates, right? Because once all the carrier proteins have something bound at that transport site, you can't make it go any faster. Good. But how about this? How about the fact that we see faster rates than simple diffusion and lower concentrations? Why does that happen? 
Why at lower concentrations, below saturation, do we see faster rates in the carrier protein than in simple diffusion? Yeah, right, so there's a specific interaction of the protein, the, the solute that's being transported, just like there's a specific interaction of a substrate with its active site. There's an affinity there, right? And that affinity actually gives a benefit for the solute in terms of going across the membrane, in terms of getting to the site where it's going to be transported across the membrane. So from an evolutionary sense, which one of these is better? Under conditions of low solute availability. The carrier protein, right? Yeah. yeah. So you should be thinking about this. Everything you should bring in, in, into play evolution, right? So carrier proteins do have an advantage over channels when concentrations are very low. Okay, let's just finish up by, I'm not going to talk much about it, but I want to remind you of something that we talked about in the previous lecture. We discussed a scenario where positive root pressure could be generated that leads to guttation, leads to water being pushed out of the leaves in relatively short plants. So we said that that positive pressure was the result of what? What happens in the root xylem to cause positive pressure? James, remember? Yes, yeah, solute buildup. Okay, so obviously the relevance to what we're talking about now. How is the solute concentration, what are the processes that give rise to higher solute concentration in the xylem? Must be then the cells around them, right? Otherwise, so water can move osmotically in there. Where is that transport that's leading to the higher solute concentration in the xylem coming from? Where does that happen? Yeah, so remember that any water and solutes from the soil going to the xylem have to cross two plasma membranes, somewhere outside the Casparian strip and somewhere inside the Casparian strip. Inside the Casparian strip, there's transport from the symplast into the apoplast. And it is wherever that transmembrane transport happens inside the Casparian strip, where that's where the energy is being spent to concentrate the solutes in the xylem. So it could be in the endodermis. It could be in the xylem parenchyma. But it has to be somewhere inside the Casparian strip because that's where it's the solutes are going from symplast to apoplast. Okay, so that's an example of the sort of thing that I, doesn't say anything about that in the book, but you should be able to figure that out.